9.30, should we make a start? Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and a very warm welcome to the first in our webinar series on delivering impactful nature-based solutions under a new environmental land management scheme. I'm Nikki Roach, I'm president-elect here at SIWEM, which is the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. For those of you who aren't familiar with SIWEM, welcome. We're a royal chartered profession uh, and we represent a community of thousands of water and environmental professionals and organisations across the world. And when we say water and environment, we mean just that. We are all about working in a really integrated way, bringing multidisciplinary skills to bear on the really knotty multi-dimensional challenges that exist in the midst of climate, nature and the sustainability emergencies that we face at the moment. Our vision is a safer, sustainable world. Right now, that seems like an incredible challenge, but one thing that's been thrust to the front of many people's consciousnesses in these recent weeks of lockdown is how important nature and our ability to interact with it really is. Nature provides us with all kinds of services, public goods in 25 year environment plan parlance, and the way that we manage our land has a massive bearing on how extensive and effective those goods are. Managing land and water in a way that delivers the best, most sustainable outcomes for people and nature is exactly what SIREM is about and exactly what this series of three webinars will be about. So if we're new to you and you to us and you like today's event, get in touch. We'd be delighted to hear from you and we'll share details about how you can do that later on. On to today's event. The drama of Brexit might seem like a world away now and perhaps a more pleasant one, but preparations continue and the Agriculture Bill was back in Parliament last week for its report stage. As we move away from the Common Agricultural Policy, the bill that establishes the legal basis for a fundamental shift in the principles under which farmers and land managers such as foresters will be financially supported outside the EU, we move towards the concept of public money for public goods. What this means is that payments under the new Environmental Land Management Scheme are moving away from the area-based payment system towards an outcomes-based system which supports the delivery of a range of public goods with three tiers proposed for how extensive and coordinated delivery of these goods will be. Of course, the 25-year Environment Plan pledges that it will be the enabler of a recovery of nature in this country and the facilitator of the widespread expansion of all kinds of nature-based solutions to challenges like decarbonisation, flood risk management, soil fertility and human health and wellbeing. These nature-based solutions need land to grow and most of the land in this country is used for agriculture and forestry and so on. So it completely stands to reason that an agricultural support scheme should be central to a concerted drive to enhance and replenish the services that nature can provide us with. DEFRA has been developing its thinking about the form and function of a new scheme over the past couple of years through its Health and Harmony consultation in 2018 and more recently through its Farming for the Future and ELM policy discussion documents and the associated consultation. Because of the disruption caused by the coronavirus crisis, this consultation has been paused. But that gives us the ideal opportunity to compare notes, share ideas and test our thinking before it resumes and we will make final responses to DEFRA. So we are delighted that we have James LePage from DEFRA with us this morning to talk through the consultation and government's current thinking on the scheme to kick us off. And with farmers right at the centre of the delivery picture of all this, it's essential that their needs are met and they're properly supported to deliver the range of goods that we will all benefit from. We're also delighted to be joined by the National Farmers Union and Dr Mari Barnes to give a farming perspective. Understanding and measuring the extent of contribution that various measures might make to providing this overall package of public goods will be vital and it isn't simple. Certain measures might be more effective in certain places and done in certain ways and there may be trade-offs. In fact it's likely that there will be. Measures delivered purely for optimum carbon sequestration benefit might not be best for nature. The Natural Capital Committee talked around these issues in their recent report on using nature-based interventions to deliver net zero. And we are honoured to have Professor Chris Collins from the committee also here this morning to talk through their recommendations and findings and how they could be reflected under ELM. Finally today we have a man who was born to rewild. There are differing degrees of how you might integrate nature-based solutions into land use and rewilding Britain have been making amazing progress in helping landowners turn previously heavily managed land back to nature with impressive results. Restoring high value and complex ecosystems to deliver a range of ecosystem services is gaining traction and Professor Alistair Driver will tell us how this could fit into the LM scheme. 
But before we launch into our talks this morning, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. So it's important to note that if you've got any questions for our panelists, there's a Q&A function. So if you could use that rather than the chat function, that would be really helpful and we'll pick those questions up. There are a lot of you joining us this morning, which is wonderful. I think at the last count, over 850. So we probably won't answer each question directly, but um, Alistair and Jay and the team from Siren will do a great job of trying to pull out some key things for us. We'll be splitting this two hour session into two halves. So we'll hear from our first two speakers, after which I'll ask them a couple of questions to start some discussion. And then we'll then come to you, the audience, for your questions. We're also going to use Slido to ask you some questions, some of which have been put forward by DEFRA to feed directly into their consultation process and to record the feedback. So please make sure if you can, that you've got a separate device that you can use Slido on. So uh, we've set up a few questions, one of which, and it'll be obvious which one, will help us and the other three have been posed by DEFRA. So I'm just going to pause and give you a quick bit of information about how to get onto Slido. So if you head to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and in the box where it says enter an event code, type G, that's G for great webinar, the team tell me, G906, G906. You should uh, get let into an event called Nature Based Solutions and ELMs. And there you'll see we've set up a poll. We've asked for your, we've asked you four questions. The first is very simple. Are you a SIREM member? It's great to see how many of you are here today. It'd be lovely to find out how many of your members. And then we get a bit more specific with three focus questions from DEFRA which are what do you think the barriers to the uptake of, of ELM may be? Are there any specific elements of ELM proposals you would like to hear more about? And if so, please say what they are. And finally, prior to the webinar, have you heard much about the ELM proposals and principles? So something to feedback on during our quick break uh, or during the rest of the event. And we'll keep that poll open for the rest of the day. So feel free to put your comments in afterwards. We'll be collating your feedback and we'll be sending it direct to DEFRA. So if you can, please do take the time to respond. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, and a final note, just to say that we're recording this webinar so we can make it available to people who are like, able to join us live. OK, that's definitely enough of me. So without further ado, it's time to introduce you to our first speaker. I'm delighted to introduce James. James LePage is the head of ELM advice and technical guidance at DEFRA. He's leading on the design and advice and environmental guidance under ELM. He's been seconded into DEFRA from Natural England to work on this programme. And he's worked on all agri-environment schemes that have existed in England since the 1990s. So, James, you are very welcome. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. If I could have the first slide up, please. OK, so, yeah, thank you for the introduction there, Nikki. And uh, yes, I'm part of the team, uh, quite a large team now in DEFRA who are working to develop a uh, new environmental land management scheme building on some 25 years or more of uh, previous schemes that we've had in England. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this scheme is just one part of DEFRA's vision for future farming um, and one part of our efforts to deliver the ambitions of the 25 year environment plan and carbon net zero. So um, as part of our overall vision, we want to reward people with public money uh, for those public goods that we know they can deliver. Uh, it's, it's a different set of terminology to what we've used before, but it, it's, it's a similar message for those who've been in agri-environment schemes for some time now. But it's also really important that we ensure there's a thriving and more self-reliant and resilient farming sector, and that we have a more trusting and productive relationship between those farmers and government. Um, and, and that's something that uh, I trust is something that we struggle with with some of our current schemes. Um, and of course, we, we want to continue with the world's class animal welfare standards um, that we have here in, in Britain. Next slide, please. So our scheme specific objectives are to secure a range of positive environmental benefits, prioritising between environmental outcomes where necessary, because the 25 year environment plan has a very broad range of environmental outcomes. You know, clean air, clean water, thriving plants and wildlife, beauty heritage and engagement and, and climate change are all issues and not everyone can do everything everywhere and we need to give some steer as to where the most important things are, what the most important things are in a particular place. Um, and this scheme is going to help tackle some of the environmental challenges associated with agriculture and forestry, focusing on how to address them in the shorter term. In doing the above, and will provide an opportunity for farmers to derive an additional income stream through the uh, delivery of our environmental payments. 
and this will become more important as direct payments are phased out. So hopefully ELM will be a form of um, business diversification and it's a way hopefully to help people see uh, their land through a different uh, lens, through a different set of eyes, see the potential they could do to deliver public goods as well as the, the things they may have more traditionally focused on. Next slide, please. So Nikki gave a brief outline of the structure and, and here it is laid out. Um, to deal with the range of challenges that this scheme has got to tackle, we think it's sensible to break it into three tiers. And tier one is hopefully something that will be easy for the majority of land managers to engage with. And the focus will be around encouraging environmentally sustainable farming and forestry. As such, the things that we can support people through in that will be widely applicable actions and outcomes. Um, just one example there, the wildflower margins or cover crops um, that people could do on arable land. Um, we'll be focusing in this tier on the things that need mass uptake to uh, provide the, the greatest environmental benefit. So what we mean by delivered at scale, lots of people doing uh, lots of stuff across the country. Tier two is where the local targeting comes in a bit more strongly. So here we're looking at more complex and demanding actions, uh, things perhaps a little more similar to what people might have been used to doing through uh, countryside stewardship higher tier or previous um, higher tier elements of schemes. And these are things that um, need to be done in the right place in the right way. I might need a little more help to make them happen. Um, there are also sometimes things that uh, will be best where there's some degree of collaboration towards common goals between land managers. So we'll be looking at how we can take forward aspects of uh, facilitation and, and coordinating people more effectively. Tier three is looking more at landscape scale land use change projects, um, where these can add value over and above what we could deliver through tiers one and two. And this is perhaps where we have some of the greatest level of innovation in scheme design. So we're, we'll be looking at our various tests and trials to see how we can choose the right uh, sort of project based approach to things and um, what's the best way of, of, of delivering them so that we get uh, ambitious environmental commitments on a large scale through a project. Next slide, please. So I mentioned tests and trials, and they're a really important part of our program. Um, so next slide, please. Um, these tests and trials started out with a, a major call out from uh, DEFRA for uh, some really, really good ideas of things that we should test um, with a view to implementing them in a future scheme. There have been two phases, and uh, we've uh, identified six priorities that these various tests and trials now cover and these are um, how best to do a land management plan, what is the role uh, and how is advice and guidance best delivered, how we best do payments, spatial prioritization so you know, how do we decide what's most important where and, and explain that, um, collaboration and innovative delivery solutions. So through phase one, we have well over 100 applications, I think, with good ideas. And we've agreed to take forward 44 proposals. And they started off um, happening on the ground from September 2019 onwards. And uh, in phase two, we've got 26 proposals take, to take forward. Next slide, please. So um, the concept is that we've got all of these uh, tests and trials, but we need to start to bring them together into something that provides more coherent whole and also test the mechanics out of, of paying people more efficiently and effectively than we have in the past. So we envisage a national pilot. Next slide, please. Um, so through this pilot, we hope to sort of finalise our learning and innovation prior to full rollout and build confidence that um, we can deliver and that we've got stakeholder support for what we're trying to do. We envisage a modular structure and this will test three main things. Firstly, how to construct different types of agreement at different scales related to the tiers that we've just explained. Secondly, how to target ELM incentives to deliver specific environmental outcomes in specific areas. And thirdly, um, to test out the underlying scheme mechanics so that things run smoothly and effectively and deliver what we need and also, most importantly perhaps, that work effectively for those who are participating. Next slide, please. 
um, in carrying through our pilot, we've got a range of uh, delivery partners identified from across the uh, DEFRA agencies. So the Environment Agency is involved, Forestry Commission, JNCC, uh, Natural England and the Rural Payments Agency, uh, as well as having a, a, a team in Corden DEFRA taking forward the policy aspects. So it's, it's a, a multi-team approach that we're taking forward. Um, and also, I should say, we've got a really excellent group of stakeholders um, who, who link to us through a national stakeholder group, but also through some uh, specific, issue-specific stakeholder groups. So, for example, I've got a, an advice and technical guidance stakeholder group that uh, meets on a roughly monthly basis, and uh, it, they're a really useful sounding board for the uh, ideas we want to take forward. Next slide, please. This gives an outline of our time frame. So the test and trials are already running and will continue to run for some time and continue to feedback through the national pilot and potentially beyond that once the, uh, the scheme is rolled out from 2024. Um, in my experience, agro-environment is in some ways a, a continuous uh, a stream of evolution over the years. Um, the national pilot itself properly is still planned to launch at some point in 2021 and will continue through till 2024 when we envisage full rollout happening. In the background, of course, there's a number of things happening with transition linked to the agriculture bill. So we envisage uh, the uh, direct payments, BPS payments being phased out over seven years and countryside stewardship still being available, um, but with some improvements to streamline how it works. Next slide, please. So a little more on transition. The uh, changes set out in the Agriculture Bill will happen gradually over seven years, giving people time to adapt. Um, applications for countryside stewardship are still open, and we've been clear that no one in a countryside stewardship agreement would be unfairly disadvantaged as and when the time comes to move through to new agreements under the, a new scheme. And until then, signing a countryside stewardship agreement, we hope, gives a viable and long-term source of income, providing the environmental benefits uh, that, that uh, we know people can deliver and there are policy needs and of course it's if you've not done agro-environment before it might be a useful way to get used to it and uh, before moving into help. The last countryside stewardship agreements will start in January 2024 and direct payments will be phased out through till 2027. Next slide please. So briefly to cover our thinking on advice because that's my lead area. Next slide please. Uh, we've talked to a whole load of people, both land managers on the ground and, and stakeholders, and looked back on, on the history of what our schemes have uh, been doing. And it's clear that advice is, is really, really important. Um, we know that advisors are important to help people develop the skills and knowledge and confidence uh, in, in doing forms of management, management that they may not have uh, been previously trained in or may not have previously focused on. Um, they can help people come together to collaborate and they're particularly important to take the information that we can provide about a scheme on a national scale and tailor it to meet local needs and circumstances. For that to be effectively carried through though, whoever does that advising needs to be trusted, they need, the advice they provide needs to be consistent, uh, credible and cost effective. Next slide please. Um, there are lots of different ways that we uh, can provide an ad advice for people participating in the scheme and this slide just attempts to show some of those. Um, so obviously that our one-to-one -one on farm advice is really important but we think there's a key role for group events perhaps linked to spatial targeting um, or to setting up facilitation. There, there could be demonstration farms and, and opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and of course we can look to the internet to social media um, so as well as maybe having a contact centre that offers telephone help, we could provide web chat and signpost people through to um, the specialist sort of advice that might be needed on, on occasion. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is my last slide and just to reflect the fact that uh, mixed in with advice, we are envisaging a variety of self-help tools online. So um, if you want to apply for the scheme, uh, you should be able to apply without having to have an advisor. Um, and uh, there could be farmer mentors and we're looking at the scope for training and qualifications for land managers themselves um, because ultimately the game here is that we want people to be uh, confident at delivering these public goods just as much as they are in delivering um, the fields of wheat or, or um, 
or livestock management as they, as they may have before. So that's the uh, summary for my presentation. Um, on to the next, Nikki, I think. Lovely, James. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting to hear. It's seven year transition as well. Um, We'll pick up some questions a bit later on just before we move on to Mari's presentation um, if you didn't catch it at the beginning we're, we're doing a poll on Slido so that's slido.com and the code is G906 so um, if you want to head over to there in the break that would be great okay so uh, we're going to move straight on and we're going to move on to Mari now and hear the National Farmers Union perspective um, and I'd really I'd like to welcome Mari to begin with Mari is the National Flood Risk and Access Policy Advisor for the National Farmers Union the NFU, which represents more than 55,000 members in England and Wales, with 46,000 agribusinesses. Mari advises NFU staff and members on issues relating to public rights of way, coastal erosion, drainage and all aspects of flood risk policy, including flood risk activity rules and regulations. I feel like I need to lie down after all that, Mary. Wow. Uh, she's also a key advisor on the NFU's lobbying around legislative and policy change. So she's really ideally placed to speak on today's topic, delivering nature-based solutions through ELMs. So Mary, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Nikki. So I'm going to start sharing with my screen. And hope that it works. So... Hopefully you can see that now. Yep, we see your slides. Perfect, thank you. So thank you Nikki and thanks for inviting me to speak today on meeting the needs of farming, nature and people through elms. So as as Nikki, uh, the view that we have up has um, your notes available. Oh, does it? Yeah. <laughs> Better not show that. Um, okay. Give me a second. How about that? Can't see the slides just yet, Mary. Okay. Mary, I think you might have to just go from one screen only. Okay. Not project. Try that. Okay. This is like collaboration in action, isn't it? I like it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so thank you, Nikki. And as you mentioned, I am the NFU's flood management and access policy advisor, not the ELM specialist, but we are thinking about how we can incorporate this future environmental land management into managing our water. And so I am going to have a bit of a water bias on what I'm going to say today, um, but I'm also going to look at um, how ELMs could support farmers um, and and how it's going to work in the future and what our main concerns are. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through the needs of farming with a special focus on water, as it said. I'm going to start with a bit of background on the 25 year environment plan and then go on to nature based solutions and the environmental land management schemes. So to start with, it's kind of hard to ignore the recent weather that we've had. Um, we started, well, February this year has been one of the wettest on record and then we went into extremely dry April. We're ping-ponging one extreme to another and farmers are almost chasing their tails to, to keep up with what the weather's going to throw at them next. So when we think about um, like climate change and what's to come in the future, we're trying to take that into consideration with um, what we want from ELMS uh, and what our members need from ELMS going forward. So one of the things that we've been thinking about uh, as the National Farmers Union is this idea of a water nexus. So we've got competing priorities. We've got in the environment, we've got people and communities, and we've got food or energy. And in the heart of that is water. And it's how we manage that water, whether it's from a resource perspective or a risk. So one of the main bits of work I'm working on just now is our integrated water management strategy. And we're going to try and work out how, one, we can find a balance that will satisfy the needs of people and ensuring that we can still produce food, but while safeguarding the environment. Um, and how can we tie in elms with that? How can that fit in with that? 
So that's one of the main areas of work that we are looking at. Now, when we think about ELM, it's hard to ignore policy. And James has highlighted some of the main things that have come into, into play when we're thinking about the new environmental land management schemes. We've got a 25 year environment plan, which sets out multiple targets. The flood and coast erosion risk management strategy also calls for adaptive measures. And then the EU's 2015 sustainable development goals um, has stated that we need nature-based solutions to mitigate hazards. So entwined in this is this idea that James has mentioned of public money for public good. So the two areas I'm going to mention are the ones in bold and I'm going to focus on those. But what I would say by focusing on these, the ones in bold, the byproducts are the last two. So by focusing on protection uh, from and mitigation to environmental hazards and this adaptation to climate change, whilst ensuring clean and plentiful water, we will be able to enhance the natural environment and will protect our heritage. Um, and engagement should come under all of them. So it's crucial. When we think about nature-based solutions and elms, um, it does seem to be something that everyone's talking about and everyone's trying to predict what's going to happen with them. And James has said, it's still in the development phase. So there's still, that it's still the early stages and nobody actually knows how it's going to work. But from a water management perspective, I'm going to focus on the three tiers that James mentioned. So from the document that was produced um, sometime in lockdown, I think it's all phased into one, so don't ask me which month it was, um, there was, there's three tiers in the document. The first is thinking about uh, encouraging environmentally sustainable farming and forestry. So if we focus on water management there, we could look at the public goods that could be associated with crop rotation, cover crops, livestock management, soil management. And then there's this really broad bullet point in there, which is water storage and efficient water use, which could go anywhere. Um, it could be from reservoirs to rainfall harvesting. So it's a me the menu of options hasn't yet been discussed, but there's, there's some ideas out there when we're thinking about nature-based solutions. So then if we move on to tier two, we've got this idea that it could be designed to support land managers in delivery of locally targeted environmental outcomes. That could include habitat and management. It could include maintenance. And um, this is something really important for us because we do have farming members that have already taken upon themselves to create some wetlands and other areas. And so maintenance is hugely important. Um, and we need to protect what we've already got rather than just create new areas. Um, but this tier wants to focus on collaboration and collaboration is something that's coming up in water management time and time again, whether it's from a quality perspective or a flood management perspective, it's always um, appearing and it's in new legislation. Um, but, and one example of this could be working farmers, working with communities and the environment agency uh, to reduce the risk of flooding. And within tier two, that could include feasibility studies, so it could be modelling, um, and it could include one-off payments for things like surveying. Um, and that seems pretty feasible because you can do that currently under countryside stewardship. That's pretty good and it's, it's you know, ticking all those boxes as a collaboration perspective. But there are things we need to consider. Firstly, farmers don't like being told how to manage the land. That's an important consideration. Secondly, whose priority will be taken forward? There could be a lot of local conflicts as to um, what should be um, taken place based. Um, and I think when it comes to that, then if you want the government to be the final arbitrator to decide which is a local priority that will go forward. But then we've got our greatest concern, and this is something that will probably come up next week in next week's seminar. There's this liability and maintenance aspect of different kinds of schemes. Um, so for this, I'm going to focus on the final bullet point, which is these kind of runoff and flow attenuation measures. Um, and with that, what we've got is features like these, like leaky dams that you can see in the picture, are popping up in catchments across the country. And farmers are put under quite a lot of pressure to install them on their land, but little consideration is given to the liability or maintenance of these features. Now, why is that a problem? Well, these are the uh, same features in the same reach um, during storm, I think this was just after storm Desmond. Um, I took these photos myself as part of previous research. But if one of these tree trunks were to break away and travel downstream and block a culvert leading to more flooding, who would be liable? 
So it's the riparian owner, which is often the farmer or the landowner. And they are the ones who have already potentially lost productive land installed in this scheme. And it possibly, probably has no benefit to them, but yet they face all the risks and are often left with a maintenance bill to boot. Because yes, natural flood management is a tool in the flood management toolbox, but their natural uh, features are made of natural products, which will rot in water and will need maintenance, just like any other flood defense structure. But we'd really urge DEFRA to address these problems whilst developing elms, because that's something that we can write in there to make sure that the liability and maintenance side of things are covered. Then if we move on to tier three, this is the final tier of looking into elms. And this one's looking at delivering landscape scale land use change projects. Um, and this is stuff that could add value over and above what will be delivered through tiers one and two, like James already mentioned. But there's loads of concerns to address here. But what we would recommend is using the time, this time that we have now in this limbo that we're living in, to build up an advisory network or an accreditation system for advisors, because it's essential that farmers get good advice. If we're thinking of landscape scale, land use change, we need to be able to ensure that the advice that farmers and landowners are getting is the best they possibly can. We have seen all too often bad advice from an advisor that leads to liability uh, on farmers and often penalties. Um, farmers' attentions, well, are being dragged from pillar to post, but everyone wants to advise a farmer. And we're going to really struggle to manage this if we don't have a good system in place. So it's crucial that farmers also have the ability to choose what's right for them and what's right for their farm. So tier three is a big one, and I think we've got a lot more discussions to have on that. So then if we come back out and think of the bigger picture, for everyone to commit to a scheme, we need to know what they're being paid for. We need to know how much they're being paid. They'll need to know how it's going to be monitored. What is the risk? The risk element of this, especially tier three type schemes, needs to be so transparent because we have to take into consideration the risk of penalties or the risk due to impacts on production of quality food. And then we've got also the impacts it could have on future land use. And these aren't norm these are normal considerations for anyone entering a business contract. You need to consider these types of things. Farms and farm businesses, they are that. They are a business and they need to have plans and they need to know exactly what the risk is. And yes, there'll be an element of uncertainty, but we need to be as clear as possible what they're taking on. So Elms, again, need to really, when we're thinking about this, be careful about what we're, how we approach land managers. And don't just tell them what to do with their land. Listen to them, engage with them on their level. Um, because otherwise you're just going to get their backs up. Um, most will approach this as a business decision, as I said, as well as considering future generations and what this means for them. When, if we go back to the public good, we talked about heritage. One of the things with um, farms is that they're often wanting to hand it down to, to their sons or their daughters. So there's that aspect of what land will be left for them to produce food. All a farmer really wants to do is produce food. And yes, they're considered as a custodian of the land, but they've got to think about their business and any uncertainty that's currently out there with uh, trade deals that haven't yet been agreed. So with all this in mind, it's not a straightforward decision. And then we've got some other kind of considerations. We've got a lessons learned approach, which I'm glad to see James has highlighted, which is great. Um, countryside stewardship had a lack of uptake. As James mentioned, there was trust issues, and it was permit heavy, it was advice heavy, and there was a question, well, there is a question of, does it pay enough? Um, there's also a consideration in here within the other bullet points that are on the screen of compatibility. There could be one group that approaches a land manager and says, you need to plant some trees. Um, but the farmer has been managing a triple SI and following all the heavy controls around that triple SI. But then somebody else comes along and says, well, actually, you need to do an environmental impact assessment. So there's all these kind of conflicting bits of information. And again, it's good to listen. And as I've mentioned, there's this uncertainty element. There's the, when you think about countryside stewardship, there's the upfront costs to get into it. And there was the previous problems with payments that made um, national news. Um, we had one farming member that incurred costs of over £80,000 waiting for a payment in January 2019. Um, that's still not gone forward. 
So would you, as a business, enter a payment, or enter into a contract with no payment terms in? So this is something else that we need to also consider. And um, we need to remember that farmers work off cash flow they, as a game. They are a business and they, don't, they can't just work off promises. So there's going to be budget problems going forward. Um, one of the main concerns for us as an organisation is our upland farmers. Currently, 75% of upland farmers are receive CAP funding. Um, and we're worried about them with how they're going to cope without this. Um, this is something that we have to think about. Now I'm going to go back to put my flooding hat on and use this example. So on here, I've got flood storage areas. This is a February this year event, so February 2020. Um, and flood storage areas like this, we have in agreements across the country. So it's usually agreements with the environment agency um, that the area will be used to store water. And there's usually some kind of financial aspect to that, sometimes, not always. Um, there's agreements like this around Lincoln, Severn Valley catchment and other areas. This one is an NFU member's land in Yorkshire. Now he, this year already, has flooded five times. Um, every time it's because water has been pushed onto his land, so it's been intentionally flooded to protect a town. So the question is, what would you pay for this? If you are situated in that town, what's that worth, that protection level? And how can we work that into Elms? Should it be based in Elms or should it be based in the flooding budget? Uh, could it be an event-based payment? rather than annualised or one-off. But we've got this, when it comes to flood funding, we've got very inaccessible funding packages, especially when we're thinking about agricultural land. So can Elms replace that? What happens when these events get more extreme? What about when the land's already saturated? I know this member personally, and he sits up at night when, it's, when it's, well, his land currently looks like this and it keeps on raining because he thinks, well, where else is the water going to go? And unfortunately, this year, it went into his farm building and his home. So he is now only living in the top floor of his property with his family, and also during lockdown, which isn't great. And that counts for all the other families and um, businesses across the country that were flooded this year. So there's a lot of questions there. And we have to think about farmers' needs going forward. But as James has said, Elms is currently fluid, nothing has been decided. So to me, it's quite an exciting opportunity to think of how we can shape this. But at the heart of this needs to be what will work for farmers. The scheme objectives need to be reviewed to encourage the production of food. Not now, more than ever, the people of Britain have said that they consider food security more important. 42% of Britons have said that because we've gone through this crazy panic buying and shelves need to be refilled. Um, and we're starting to realize that we are an island nation facing over 62% of import deficits this year. So this is something that we need to think about and include in Elms. Farms are dynamic businesses that Elms needs to embrace. Business partnerships are constantly changing. And as the land is managed by what any one business, there's the average length of a farm business tenancy also to consider but the average length is less than three years. So how would we get an ELM project to work when it's over five? So we need a flexibility element to ELMs and we'd really encourage that. If we think about the public good that our farmers are and can do when it comes to flood risk mitigation or carbon net zero, which can all be delivered for ELMs, then in doing so we need to address, well, in doing this, it addresses the needs of nature and people because it's a bit of a byproduct. If we look after our food and we look after how we manage our water and we ensure that we safeguard the environment, we'll make sure that we take into consideration people and the environment's needs. There are lots of questions that need to be answered before anyone can give a definitive answer. All we have at the moment is a sketch outline of ELMS. So what, what it depends on now is how we fill that in. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to Nikki. Thanks, Mari. That's great. Uh, lovely. So, um, Chair's prerogative, I get to ask a couple of questions. So I'm going to do that first. But I can see the Q&A is really busy, which is wonderful. Um, I would encourage you to um, use the Q&A rather than the chat function for any questions, if that's OK, guys. 
Um, for, for me, that was a it was you know somebody that is not an expert in this at all. That was fascinating. I am don't know about you, but I'm increasingly reminded of how everything is connected at the moment. And um, I guess for you know with my siren hat on, that's exactly what we're all about. It's the nexus of the water and the environment and food and energy. And so um, fascinating to hear how policy and then the if you like the recipients of that are, are kind of thinking about this. So I guess we you know we're we're aware of the scale of the environmental challenge we face. In some instances, our natural environment is in a fairly precarious state, um, and we know that we need to take urgent and fairly profound action to start tackling climate change. So in your opinion, James Murray, does the scale of ambition um, reflect the scale of these challenges? Is, is this a real step change in terms of how land managers can be supported to deliver for the environment? And I suppose, Murray in particular, how far does that support need to go to achieve the kind of progress that we need to see? James? Okay, yeah, I'll go first then. Um, so in terms of DEFRA, you know, our steer comes from the 25-year environment plan and the ambitions for net zero, and, and they, that, that represents huge ambition. Um, and, you know, as, as Mahiri's almost laid out, designing an agri-environment scheme that to, can cover all that ambition is, is no easy thing. There's a lot of considerations there, a lot of issues to deal with. Um, but if, if you if you think that um, we're not only um, looking at a better way of designing an agro-environment scheme, but also phasing out direct payments, then it is quite a transformational change in our approach to the relationship between government and land managers. Um, you know, I, I, I've always sensed that under the common agriculture policy, you've got kind of a, a, a twin dynamic of, of uh, either being more productive or doing stuff for the environment a little bit on the side because agri-environment is such a small part of it and what the ag agriculture bill does is change that relationship really and it says ultimately you know the public money is largely for the public goods that people can provide um, and that in effect if you want to be a thriving profitable business then being green is perhaps one of the best ways to do that being more sustainable looking after your natural assets better and seeing new market opportunities that this scheme could effectively provide by uh, you know providing a means to reward people for a whole range of things other than what the, the markets provide. So, um, you know, ultimately the big question will be how much budget does Elm get to spend? And I can't answer that at the moment, but uh, the policy ambition is absolutely there, yes. Thanks, James. That's, it's, well, it's good to hear. I think we would all be supportive of that. We want, we want ambitious, don't we? Um, Mari, your thoughts? Yeah, I think when you think about real step change, at the moment all we've got is the development of this scheme design. Um, we're at really early stages, very little detail. And I would love it to be ambitious, but I think at the heart of it, we need to have farmers in mind because they are losing out on this cap payment. And we have some that, as I said, 75% of upland farmers rely on that payment. So if there isn't a like for like type theme or better, I don't know where it's going to go from there. And we've got to think about our heritage. We've got to think about our countryside that we love. And we love it because it is a farmed environment. It's a working environment. And we need that to ensure that we've got the food security that we have. As James said, we don't know where the budget's going to go uh, for this. We, that, that was unknown before we went into a global pandemic. Um, now it's probably going to be hit by this, as will many other budgets. So there's that kind of and um, as James has said, there's there's a lot of warm words from DEFRA, which is great, um, about a simple scheme, about taking on these lessons learned. But that is a narrative that we heard before. We heard that when we went into countryside stewardship, and it didn't work. So what we really need now is some some something and and a system that recognises how bureaucratic countryside stewardship was and is, and how can we overcome that before we go any further. I mean, I could come back on that last point, Nikki. Yeah, please do. Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, yeah, fully agree that countryside stewardship was um, burdened with a bureaucracy focused around ensuring everybody was absolutely compliant, but that risks people just not wanting to engage in the first place. And a large part of that was driven through the, uh, the rules that we were obliged to abide by from the European Commission. So, um, you know, there was a, a risk of dis disallowance, a, a zero tolerance approach to that was taken. And, you know, uh, uh, 
definitely had to try and find ways that made it look like well not made it look like that, that, that showed that we were being 100 percent compliant as much as we could but of course you know the natural environment such a variable thing isn't it and yeah. it's so hard for us to say uh, you must do this in this way so we can inspect it in the field when what works in cornwall might not work in terms of exact timing or approach in cumbria so um we, we really are wanting to take this opportunity this time to make our own rules here and uh provide a lot more flexibility and restore that issue of trust as well around the payments so yeah you're absolutely right Mahiri that there's been a, a, a real issue there I know things are better but it, the, the trouble shouldn't have happened in the first place and that's why rather than just try and launch a new scheme with a big bang we want to ramp one up um, with a decent piloting period in the first place. Sounds good let's hope it goes through. <laughs> It's, re it's reassuring to hear it's being heard, I think, Mari, which is, which is positive. I guess um, I I'm going to come to Alistair in a second from uh, Simon, who's been co coordinating all the kind of questions you've been putting through. But just I guess just one final question for me, building on that point around kind of complexity and bureaucracy. Um, Mari, do you think, uh, like, how do you think farmers might be potentially motivated to engage with perhaps the higher tiers of, of um, ELM than they did under the Common Agricultural Policy? Well, I think it depends on... The individual farm business because if you think about some of the things in tier three which could be um, woodland creation that is no longer farmed land so we're literally turning away from farming and um, if that suits an individual farm business then then they will probably be more than happy to go into an elm scheme but otherwise it needs to be up to an individual and it needs to be all the risks associated with it needs to be transparent and um, if you think about woodland creation from a flooding perspective um, there's the evidence-based kind of outcome of it, so there's very little known about the actual reduction of uh, the flood peak, uh, extreme events, um, when you plant trees. And then you're not going to have any kind of impact for at least 15 to 20 years when you do, after you do plant them. Um, so if this is an outcome-based kind of payment, it's not going to work. So then we're going to have to, what are they going to do, rip up the trees? Um, so I think there's that kind of aspect of it as well. We need to have outputs rather than outcome. Um, and that will help to build on that trust and help people uh, and our farmer and members sign up to it. That's really helpful. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Alistair Chisholm. Alistair is the Director of Policy at SIWEM. Um, and see if we can get some questions or I guess themes. We've had a lot of questions, which is great. But Alistair, do you want to maybe see if you can coalesce those and put a couple of questions to our panellists? Sure. Uh, morning, guys. Um, there's been quite a bit come through around uh, the issues of, of training and advisors, um, particularly a fair bit of concern that uh, in recent years, um, Natural England funding has, has fallen quite a lot, um, impacting the availability of advice uh, for farmers and landowners. Um, so given the importance of the advice to making elms work and bed in quickly, is there an ambition, uh, obviously taking your point, um, James, that you can't really comment on levels of investment, but from a policy perspective, is, is advice something that is really going to be prioritised um, through the transition? Um, also, there's a, a range of organisations that can provide advice to farmers and landowners, water companies in a catchment context, for example. How uh, are you thinking all of that various advice can be coordinated so that it's, it's consistently high quality? Um, and finally, uh, is the intention that advice will be largely free? um to to those receiving it uh, there's some concern at the the charges the hourly rates charged by the likes of the environment agency for advice um again the, the challenges in in this time of change uh, around access to to that kind of advice provision so it'd be interesting to get your views on those okay thanks alistair so yeah a number of different things there aren't there so on who provides advice um agri-environment schemes are always provided a mixture of approaches to advice. So um, if you look back to entry level stewardship, um, we didn't provide advisors for that. Uh, we provided uh, a manual and if people needed to get additional advice, they, they bought that through their regular trusted advisor. Um, whereas the higher tiers, we've traditionally provided a greater deal of advisory support because we, you know, the, the changes involved are more challenging, more complex. Um, but there, there, there have certainly been issues with um, the accessibility of, of advice through current schemes. Um, 
and we don't want advice to be a bottleneck to people coming in absolutely not and, and especially with the, the sheer scale of ambition you know if we were to get the same number of people in to elm as for example who currently claim direct payments that's a massive shift in the number of people participating in, in such a scheme so um, i do envisage a, a large proportion of the advice coming from um, the market across elm so on one hand it that it kind of means that it's it's chargeable but we've got to make sure that the scheme itself is an attractive business proposition as Mahiri said earlier in the first place so that that's, that's an investment rather than just an overhead you know so if, if, if the scheme is designed in a way that clearly shows that the, the more effort you put in the, the better advice you receive the more money you can get out of it then um, you know that that should be uh, a good motivation to get advice in the same way that you, you would get if you're an arable farmer an agronomist to help you provide a better crop um, you know if, if the incentive is there then paying for it in itself shouldn't be a barrier that said you know some of these things need to be tested and trialed through um, the, uh, the, the, the well, through test and trials at the moment and, and through the, the national pilot to see whether for some sectors from some types of people um, charging paying for advice would be a, a real barrier um, you know, there are means to provide uh, direct support for some things so uh, for example we could provide um, a payment to support a particular aspect of the application process like land management planning uh, I think the national pilot might look to provide an additional incentive early on for um, people who are prepared to help engage in, in, in this, the pilot itself in terms of learning so you know coming to events giving their, their feedback you could pay people for that as well so there's um, a range of different things that we could do we also recognize that advice tends not to be just one person there's generally a network involved so whilst you might have someone who is your, your trusted advisor um, they may for some things need to turn to a specialist of some sort whether it's an ecologist an agronomist someone to do with a, a permit or um, uh, something to do with a, a, a legal requirement um, we think our arm's length bodies would have a really strong role in some of those things and that could be that could be free advice still um, uh, I could imagine that you know if you've got a site of special scientific interest um, Natural England would still have a, a need to get involved in, in doing a consent so they may well be able to still provide advice in, in those circumstances and there's a whole question mark around that landscape scale coordination as well um, that's something that uh, you know the, the countryside stewardship facilitation fund is, is, is shown works really well in bringing people together giving a nudge people to coordinate to common goals um, so there's there's a, an advice role around convening groups uh, and then facilitating people to work to common goals so um, i think i've kind of covered off all three of your questions there in in, in that but uh, do prompt me if you, if, if you need more i wondered if mari's got any views on it I was just going to say that one of, it is one of our concerns that a lot of money will go into paying for advisors rather than actually be used to roll out some environment land management schemes. It's something that we see on various different um, aspects of environmental management as it currently stands, so there is a bit of a uncertainty there. Um, but as I've said already, for, for ELMS to be attractive, um, it needs to be as simple and it needs to be simple and clear. So it shouldn't be so complex that you need a suite of advisors. We need it to be as obvious as possible, what yep. you will get, what the risks will be, and how we can take it forward. Agree. And on that, you know, we're not likely to mandate that people have an advisor. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm also keen that, um, you know, the bottom line here is people might need an advisor because they're doing things that they're not either previously trained in or don't have the experience or competence in and there's different ways that people can gain that so if if land managers themselves are able to get access to courses and that we could recognize that they've got a qualification or you know ongoing cpd going on then then that would be great too wouldn't it so you you reduce a dependence on advice although i'm sure advice from a whole variety of sources will still be a a, a key element in in the scheme going forward um, I've got uh, another couple of other themes coming through, one relating to uh, timescales, really, um, and a bit of concern around um, the like, uh, BPS ending in 2021, ELM really kicking in in 2024, and a bit of a feeling that there's, there's going to be a, a bit of limbo in between times and, and whether or not there's going to be um, support available in those intervening years and, and how farmers who are keen to start delivering um, NFN schemes, for example, might be able to get support during during those intervening years. 
Yeah. No, it, 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 it's an, an obvious concern people have, isn't it? And, and understandably. And um, I mean, the main message I, I, I gave in the presentation is that as well as the direct payments being phased out, and it's a phase out, um, that countryside stewardship is still there. And we are looking to make big improvements to the way that operates to make it smoother, simpler. You know, the payments are becoming more reliable. So um, until ELM is fully rolled out, countryside stewardship remains the main uh, means by which we can reward people for public goods. Um, DEFRA is looking at other grants that can be made available to help people through the transition period alongside it. Great, thank you. And um, on, on funding, um, and particularly um, how L might sit alongside other sources of funding, so there's a number of organisations developing private schemes to develop mm -hmm. um, landscape scale change. Um, either using green or, or social investment. Um, will ELMS allow, or are you thinking it will allow for a blended approach to, to financing schemes? And if so, how might that work? And will it ensure that farmers that, that do get involved with those schemes aren't disadvantaged in, in the future? Yeah. No, it's important that we don't crowd out the scope for innovation. Um, and we have worked with a number of organisations in the past who've looked to do innovative things like Southwest Water for example with auctions um i think there's a that th there'll always be a need to show that we're not paying for the same thing twice but so long as there's clarity that um we are paying for something and then someone else on the same land is paying for something else then that shouldn't be a problem um i know there was a great deal of caution um in certainly blending different eu funded schemes in the past because of ner nervousness over the rules there um, and that's hopefully something that we can improve on. But yeah, absolutely. I would, I would like to see the potential for, for people to engage in multiple different incentives um, if they're available and all pull in the you know, same direction. And that's an important role perhaps of a, a convening group around uh, a particular theme in an area to, to signpost to, to different types of funding that are available. Great, thanks. Mari, have you got anything to add on any of the, the couple of last questions at all? Uh, I'd probably just say that when we're thinking about natural capital and how other under other funding streams for environmental um, that are going to provide a public good, I think we need to think quite carefully about how we're going to do that. Because um, I've gone to some farms up in, one was in Cumbria, where they're part of um, Nestle. Um, is a dairy farmer that provides milk for them and they have a, a menu that they can tick what they want to do and it could be um, one of attenuation features it could be a bit of woodland planting and it can be whatever suits them and they get points for what they tick so it would be interesting to see how it will work with something like that and I guess it'd be again up to the farm business as to whether he wants to remain on that um, probably very flexible menu of choices with his uh, supplier um, than with um, and with the elms. I don't know. So it'd be interesting to see how it's going to go forward. Great, thank you, Nikki. Have we got time for one really quick one, or do you want to? Oh, um, is it a really good one? It, it is quite different, and it, it should hopefully go. be quite quick. Um, it's it. really Let's just um, concerning the ability of, of local authorities, for example, to to potentially be able to access funding under ELMS um, because there was some concern that uh, they were a little bit hamstrung by the NERC Act Biodiversity Duty before, which they were expected to be discharging anyway, um, but often don't have any source of, of funding to, to be able to do that. So um, is there going to be more option under ELM for them to get that funding to discharge that duty? Um, well, I think the short answer is the eligibility rules have not been sorted out yet. Um, uh, a bit like double funding, we can't pay for things that people are already obliged to do. So I think that would also come down to the relationship that the government has, you know, what it's telling people you must do as an authority, and therefore, you know, they, they have an obligation uh, relative to what they may wish to do over and above that, which we could certainly help out with. Um, I think with previous schemes, there was definitely a, a boundary between entry level stewardship and higher level, where entry level stewardship was seen as um, being similar to the obligations on some authorities, whereas high level wasn't. So people could go in for high level, but not entry. Great, okay. thank you. Wonderful, great stuff. 
thank you both so very much that was well that was really interesting uh, we are going to take a uh, i think they're called bio breaks these days we're going to take a quick comfort break go and grab a brew um if you haven't already then log into slido.com and it's g906 there's an opportunity there to answer the question for us but also the questions that we're going to feed back into DEFRA's consultation um so we're going to start again at 10 35 sharp see you shortly hear me by the way chris or alice just give me a quick nod yeah i can hear you really well perfect great that's wonderful uh wonderful right oh, welcome back hope everybody has had a chance to grab a drink my lightsabers are going to go down as my cup of coffee gets cold so um we're going to crack on with our second round of talks so um first up i'm really delighted to welcome professor chris collins so chris is from the natural capital committee um he's chair of environmental chemistry at the university of reading and his research focuses on determining the factors controlling exposure of biota to environmental pollution to develop the evidence base for regulators. Amongst many other roles, he's the NERC Soils Coordinator, overseeing a £10 million research investment programme to improve our understanding of how soils resist, recover and adapt to land use and climate change. Chris joined the Natural Capital Committee in 2018 and we are delighted to have him with us today. So, Chris, I'm going to hand over to you to get started. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Welcome in these uh, slightly strange times. Uh, hopefully that the screen share should now work. Yeah, great. Um, so as uh, Nikki said, I'm from the Natural Capital Committee. Uh, our mainly expertise that I bring to the committee is on chemical exposures and soils, but we also have experts across the committee who deal with economics, uh, the marine environment and biodiversity and the natural capital committee was the sort of principal committee that drove through the 25 year environment plan very much sort of leading to uh, these sort of nature based interventions as we call them i'll explain why shortly uh, that we're discussing today so why do we choose nature based interventions i think our concern with people using nature based solutions is life as normal can carry on and all those other activities that result in greenhouse gas emissions and other pressures to create climate change aren't addressed. So we see these as part of an overall change and that's why we see them as interventions rather than solutions. Um, most of what I'll be talking around this morning uh, is from this particular report that was recently out and is downloadable from the Natural Capital Committee website. So I'm really just giving you a, a short whistle stop tour through the, this document, but uh, uh, obviously with my own um, expertise brought to the fore. So when we're talking about natural capital, what we're really talking about is how our natural capital stocks uh, and the flows that those and the ecosystem services that those flows provide and the value that they give us and then in particular what we're talking about today is the sort of farming and flood prevention was also mentioned and obviously elms is the sort of economic management that allows us to do the management of respiration to build those stocks um, manage the extraction and use but also gives us some in uh, we do have investment outside of those sorts of schemes in order to get the economic value. But as we extract from those stocks, obviously they decline, same as your bank account declines when you go spending. So just give you an overview of the Natural Capital Committee. As I say, one of our primary outputs, uh, this was on the first phase of the committee where I wasn't present, was that led to the 25 year environment plan uh, announced by Theresa May. Uh, we're an independent advisory committee and it's really to get the natural capital thinking at the heart of government and that's looking at all our natural assets that's forests rivers land minerals and oceans and we've got a broad remit to look at all those natural assets and how they impact on those sort of 10 goals of the climate uh, of the sorry of the 25 year environment plan and we had a specific remit when uh, Michael Gove was Secretary of State to advise on what the plan should aim to achieve. And we do comment 
on the annual report of the performance of the 25 year environment plan and our comments on the 25 year environment plan are also available online at, uh, at our website. So our current thinking around the delivery of the 25 year environment plan is that it should address all those 10 goals. So not just thinking about air quality, water, biodiversity and resource efficiency that are in the environment bill, but also thinking about beauty and heritage in the wider environment and also about how we mitigate and adapt to climate change uh, and also within those goals. And what we really, there's two sort of elements I'll keep pressing as I go through my talk this morning. And one is that we have proposed an England-wide environment census for the stock of our natural capital assets, uh, remembering that the NCC advice is primarily targeted at England, not Wales and Scotland, they are independent in, in this context. And we, we need to establish this census so we have a baseline which we can reliably measure our progress against those 25 year goals. If you don't know what you've got, you don't know what different interventions are improving those stocks. Uh, and our sort of second thing uh, we need to really focus on as a committee and we're, we're promoting is that natural capital approach should be at the heart of all government decision making. So that's local planning, infrastructure and efforts to achieve net zero. And really with that, we're focusing on net environmental gain, not net biodiversity gain, which is what the current legislation targets. So what's our rationale for the nature based interventions? Um, in 2019, the UK legislated to set a target of net zero by 2050. And obviously that requires a rapid reduction in our current greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the UK Committee on Climate Change has recommended that land use change is part of a holistic strategy and over here on the right of the slide you can see the document again that's free downloadable from the Committee on Climate Change website and discusses their strategies but again they emphasize this holistic strategy and uh, that what we didn't want is a target solely focused on carbon and carbon capture that would then maybe uh, risk other functioning ecosystems. So a classic example of that would be totally focusing on forestry in order to sort of uh, get carbon capture without thinking about the broader environmental impacts that you're trying to achieve or, or putting forestry in inappropriate places as we have done in the past, such as on peatlands. Uh, another example of the, a sort of single target is the common agricultural policy, which is totally focused on food, well certainly uh, the tier one elements of it were rather than sort of focusing on the uh, wider environmental objectives. So in integrating net zero into a broader environmental policy, we need to remind ourselves that one of the 25 year plan goals is mitigating and adapting to climate change, that's, climate, that's goal seven. But we need to be pushing the government to develop a joined up response to climate change. Uh, currently, there's no overall coordination and as you can see on the right slide, these are just my current estimates of, of the different uh, departments that are engaged with uh, addressing climate change. There may well be others and I'm sure you could have a competition amongst yourselves trying to pick out the different uh, um, responsibilities across government. So as I say, it's important that we integrate net zero into environmental policy. Uh, the environment and agricultural bills are critical to that. And obviously the main delivery framework uh, was uh, emphasized by the first talk this morning it is ELM. And that's obviously why we've got a huge debate around ELMs and how they're delivered. But we really, as we say, we want an integrated, holistic natural capital system based approach to get nature uh, uh, at the heart of what we do. So that needs to maximise the enhancement of our natural assets, uh, assets sorry, and ecosystem services. And we should not forget uh, well-being in that. If you actually do a lot of the economic evaluation of various um, interventions, it's the well-being 
to humans and the sort of uh, preventive costs in visits to hospitals. There's been lots of talk about mental health and the lockdown that uh, what is the sort of primary benefit in terms of economics. But we need to minimise those costs and we need to properly consider the trade-offs uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, as I said, one of our primary drivers is to ensure we look at uh, environmental net gain, uh, not biodiversity net gain. I mean, the cartoon I've done on the right is probably not completely accurate, but I think I noticed in the chat earlier on, people saying that if we only focus on triple SIs and other such activities, they tend to be focused on sort of iconic species and do not consider the sort of broader environmental benefits. Uh, and I guess another classic example would be, you know, a small bit of green space uh, that's lost in an urban development could have potential huge value for well-being, as I said earlier, though it may not have great biodiversity value. Okay, uh, and I think the other thing that, uh, when I was taken onto the committee to sort of pull up the soil side, but we also took on uh, a marine scientist, um, Mel, who is also critical to that. And we shouldn't forget the uh, role of the marine environment in net zero. So uh, nature-based interventions to deliver net zero, they can enhance our stocks uh, of our natural assets, as I said in our first slide, and that helps us to build our overall natural capital. So that's in enriching the country, uh, but it's not a, as I said, we, why we use interventions, not solutions. It's not an alternative to systemic reduction of overall carbon emissions. And I think the reason we're all focused on these nature-based interventions is because of their potential. Um, so we can see here the greenhouse gas removal of afforestation, uh, wetland and peatland coastal restoration and soil carbon sequestration, they compare very, very favorably with direct air capture or low carbon concrete. And these are examples from the uh, Committee of Climate Change uh, uh, report that I referred to earlier. And you can see cost-wise, they're, they're quite considerably cheaper, or possibly an order of magnitude compared with the more engineered solutions. And in terms of their readiness, they are also more ready in most cases to implement than some of these technological solutions. So uh, again, when we're thinking about these interventions, we want to make sure that we've got a broad spectrum of those interventions and that they are taking in the whole, this holistic net environmental gain principle. And we don't want to get totally focused on the price of carbon. And if we do use the price of carbon as one of our drivers in, in order to get the changes, that price needs to take in those other ecosystem services and public goods such as uh, you know, flood prevention. Uh, and in my own area, obviously, the maintenance of biocarbon stocks in soils is as important as creating new, new stocks of biocarbon uh, with forest. So good soil management, which I'll come to later, is an essential part of these uh, interventions. So nature-based interventions should be uh, in designed so that they mitigate against greenhouse gases, but also, you know, we all know our climate is changing, so there needs to be adaptation and resilience to future climate. In Mari's talk, she was referring to about how we're getting this sort of rapid changes from sort of very dry periods to very um, high rainfall periods. And that's definitely what the climate predictions are telling us. So we need our, our farming and our management of the landscape to reflect that. So within that, the government needs to uh, increase its tree planting. It needs to increase soil and peat carbon. Uh, peat carbon is obviously the thing to focus on. There's much higher stocks of carbon in peats than in soils, but soil carbon is critical to a lot of other ecosystem services that I'll come to later. But we also need to improve our wildlife and biodiversity, uh, manage our freshwater and wetlands, and look at sea use changes. There's uh, some concerns, for example, in the marine environment about the way we do our, um, some of our fishing 
the, uh, and the way it affects the seabed and that removes of a lot of our potential to store carbon in the um, in the material that grows on the seabed uh, and can sequester carbon such as seaweeds. So as I said, not it won't land use change doesn't affect green just greenhouse balance, but there's multiple other benefits and costs that have been touched on by a number of different speakers this morning. So there's there's the overall agricultural production, there's our timber output, there's our seafood production, uh, right through to urban cooling and you know what was again touched on earlier is the you know how we look at our sort of cultural values and the provision of amenity views and how do we establish uh you know we talked about hill upland hill farming is that the amenity view we want or not that will very much depend uh, in uh, the eye of the beholder so something we have to try and pull out as we develop the sort of tier three uh, elms payments so while we're particularly concerned about agriculture, well, agriculture is responsible for roughly 10% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. But unlike other sectors, it is stubbornly refusing to move uh, 1990 to 2018. So across that 30 year period, there's been very little reduction in the outputs from agriculture. Actually, the primary changes have been in our energy supply as we've moved away from coal fired stations. So increasing tree cover is obviously a, a key benefit and there's lots of discussion around how we increase tree cover and the habitats for wildlife they create. As I mentioned earlier, their ability to provide recreation and well-being, storage and protection as well as urban cooling and importantly uh, cleaning of air in urban areas, uh, removal of particulates and also some of the NOx gases close to roads is uh, one of the key roles of tree cover. But we need to be mindful that the nursery sector probably unlikely has the capacity to uh, develop, to quickly step up to the 30,000 hectares of tree planting that needed. And we do need to improve our actual management of woodlands. Only 59% of woodlands are currently actively managed. And if we're gonna maintain these new trees, we need to uh, reduce squirrel and deer populations. So I, I referred earlier to uh, the need for improved soil management and that can provide improved nutrient cycling, water regulation, carbon storage uh, and biodiversity. And I think why I focused on carbon is carbon does touch on all of these individual bullet points here. So if we can enhance uh, carbon in our soils, we are got a good chance of improving all these different points here. Most of our arable soils particularly are, um, uh, do have the potential to increase carbon. There was a very a famous study by Cranfield that showed a lot of our arable soils uh, had been degraded in carbon. Um, so I'm aware that Nikki's coming online, so I need to wrap up. We've got two more, two or three more slides, Nikki, so I'll, I'll finish off. Uh, peat is critical to that. Uh, as I say, 78% of peatlands are degraded uh, and there are a large sort of emissions in this degraded state. Uh, and I spoke roughly about uh, mineral soils in the previous slide. So just going back to the sort of key point of needing the census. So we do a, a census of our population that allows us to derive where we invest. So we feel we need an environmental census to enable us to invest appropriately across the country in the right place. There's evidence gaps uh, and we, what we don't have is good modelling to understand how we target these different investments in different areas and the graph just shows on the side you could, you need to not just think about carbon sequestration but actually there's a lot of value in pollution removal. So uh, and, and my final uh, slide is just to say it's all very good doing our own internal address of uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions but a lot of the UK footprint is uh, abroad so nearly 50% of our uh, foot UK footprint is from uh, overseas activities so we need to think about that as we're designing our interventions and apologies for going over time.
don't worry chris it's fine it's really interesting stuff we'll cope uh thank you that was great that was really interesting um just a quick point before we move on to alistair in a second um lovely to see so many questions coming through thanks for using the q a function i've spotted a few people saying where are the questions that alice is uh, talking about so the questions are um only visible to the panelists at the moment uh, and alice is trying to pull some key themes together we'll do our very best to answer some of your questions i've certainly seen some around why are we talking about environmental net gain versus biodiversity net gain for example we'll try and pull some of those together in the q a at the end if we don't get to your question I think what I would encourage you to do, and certainly what James, I'm sure, would do, is to respond to the DEFRA consultation. Um, and that's a great place to be able to put some of the questions that we may not cover off today. But we'll certainly aggregate the questions and share those with the panellists at the end. So uh, we're going to move straight on. I'm delighted to welcome our final speaker for today, Professor Alistair Driver from Rewilding Britain. Alistair is cited in Who's Who for influence and distinction in the field of conservation, environmental conservation. He's an expert country naturalist and ecologist with 42 years professional experience and many hundreds of conservation projects under his belt. Since January 2017, he's been the director of Rewilding Britain with a focus on influencing government policy and establishing rewilding projects in England and Wales. So over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to give you uh, a quick rattle through on uh, what I think is a good news story. I, I firmly believe that this new agricultural policy is the best opportunity for restoring biodiversity that I've seen in my 40 odd professional years. And, and I believe if we get it right, we really can turn things around. But part of getting it right involves incorporating the right tools in the toolbox. And one of those tools, in my view, has to be rewilding. So what I'm gonna do is give you a quick resume of what I mean by rewilding. It's important that we're all on the same page. Those who've heard, who've heard me speak before will have heard me do this at greater length and just quick rattle through that and then show where we at Rewilding Britain are thinking that rewilding could fit into this future environmental land management scheme for the benefit of landowners, farmers, and for the natural environment. So first of all, uh, I always want to start with the premise, traditional conservation practices on their own are not enough to achieve significant wildlife recovery. I can say that because I've been involved in hundreds and hundreds of projects over many decades with thousands of people, and goodness knows where we'd be if we hadn't done all this great work, but it's clearly not enough. And to multiply that up tenfold or a hundredfold is simply not affordable. So we're going to have to find something complementary to that. We need to keep the jewels in the crown that we've got. We need to continue to maintain the, the, these uh, special nature reserves and protected sites, but we've got to find something else as well to complement that, which is less expensive to maintain in the long term. And that's something else, in my view, is rewilding. The other thing, just to point out, littered through this presentation, you will see images which I won't refer to with a little bit of information underneath like this one. This shows you examples of projects uh, around the country which are already happening, which are, we consider to be on the rewilding spectrum, a spectrum which I'll come to in a minute. The, uh, the, the next uh, thing to quickly do is give you a, a brief sort of tweetable definition. And this is it, large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. Now, no one owns the definition of rewilding. This is a potted version of, uh, of our definition of rewilding Britain. But if, if you focus on those words, those key words, then that is an important uh, basis for, for viewing how rewilding might fit in. Large scale, very important, moving towards the point where nature is taking care of itself. Uh, in reducing management over time, absolutely critical. Alistair, sorry to interrupt you mid-flow. Do you think you could maybe just knock your video off? Your sound's just failing and I'm wondering if it's it might be a broadband issue. If you wouldn't mind just turning the video off, let's just see if that improves the sound, that's all. Uh, yes. Um, yes, the video of me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, obviously. <laughs> that's great, let's see if that improves. Yeah, absolutely, that's much, much better. <laughs> From my <laughs> perspective <you>. as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so here are some key principles. People are fundamental to this. It is not about land abandonment. Humans belong in this environment. They are equally important 
along with other species? Can, the, the question is, can we belong there without seriously impacting on other species? Scale, size matters. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Natural processes are what we should focus on whenever making decisions. How can we encourage natural processes to prevail? It will almost always require intervention. So I describe it as a marathon with a sprint start. You're going to have, need to intervene to kickstart those natural processes. And it is not about looking back to a specific point in time in the past. It's, it's about being fit for the future, making sure that our land and water is fit for the future, future climate change, future populations, etc. Um, so yes, we must recognize what we had and understand why that was there and what we might have again, but it's very much about looking forward. And now I have seized up. Uh, sorry, can, can you hear me? Is the first question. Yep, we can still hear you. Yep, we're just on okay. the key principles um, of rewilding. I am unable at the moment to uh, forward my screen. That's okay. If you want to, so, if you want to carry on, that'd be great, and yeah. we'll see at the Sirem end if we can, if we can do anything about that for you. If you can, that would be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Um, so um, I, I talked about uh, natural process prevailing. I was going to show you a very nice uh, schematic from NEP, which we will come back to. Um, that I want to talk about the, the spectrum of rewilding. Um, that is a very important uh, aspect to consider. If you imagine a graph with management in the vertical scale and, and uh, size along the bottom, most of our uh, sites in Britain, our protected sites, are up in the top left-hand corner. They are quite heavily managed and relatively small. What we need to do is, is start to try and restore sites that are uh, less managed and greater in size. And so moving diagonally from top left of the graph down towards the bottom right hand corner. And as you move right to that corner, you may well get to what some people would call wilderness. But for the, for, for the foreseeable future, certainly for generations ahead, we need to focus on the journey. Um, hopefully now you can see the, uh, the natural process uh, imagery that I wanted to show you from NET, which, um, which I was just referring to. This just shows you um, how natural regeneration, along with certain intervention like exclusion of animals for a certain period and, uh, and then uh, allowing animals in after a while, uh, breaking up land drains at the beginning. This shows you, I'll just run it again, how uh, arable field with good hedgerows can through natural regeneration over a period of 15 years be transformed. And we talk a lot about tree planting, woodland planting. Yes, that's important, but it's very, very important as part of the Future Realm Scheme, we allow for natural regeneration to be, to be a key element uh, of the scheme. So there was the spectrum that I was talking about, wilderness in the bottom right hand corner, protected sites in the top left, and uh, some of our existing rewilding sites. I've started to enter a few specific sites onto this diagram. This is taken from a, a this is an adaptation of John Lawton's work. Um, this is very much a draft schematic by the way. Don't pick me up on the precise location of some of these things. Um, I'm still working on that but essentially we want to try and move in that direction towards wilderness in certain parts of our country. And we know from the NEP example in Airedale that, that rewilding uh, means greater biodiversity. There is plenty of evidence out there to suggest that it really is making a difference in those locations. And rewilding at scale can bring not only this greater biodiversity, but a, a nature-based economy which, which provides diversification opportunities. Uh, it can leave land and water in a, a better condition for future generations. And of course, it can deliver multiple public goods that, like those that we've heard about already today. And some of those public goods uh, can be found in the uplands, some in the lowlands, some in, in and around our coast. I give presentations on, on these kind of benefits and the evidence from, from these catchment type interventions. There's plenty of evidence to tell us what we need to do and where to do it. And really importantly, rewilding is becoming more and more popular. This is uh, a map and a graph showing you uh, 
uh, where there are currently large scale sites over a thousand acres in England. Uh, the Scottish sites need more work because there's more far more going on in Scotland. But there are already around 20 large sites in England. And if you look at the graph, you will see the hectareage is up around in the 30,000 hectares mark of, of areas, clusters of farms or big estates where rewilding is underway at scale. So it is becoming more and more popular with farmers and landowners. It, and and it is therefore is something that they are uh, increasingly keen to do. I just want to quickly mention the issue about food. You, if you're a fan of rewilding or, or mentioning it, you will get challenged on this. But these bullet points here are very important to remember. We waste 40% of the food we produce to eat. That is the number one most important thing to remember. We need to get on top of that if, if we are concerned about food production. And anyway, rewilding sites uh, tend to take place on marginally productive land. They tend to already produce food. And as you know, technology is moving in a direction that whether we like it or not, is probably going to reduce demand for meat and crops. But essentially, rewilding Britain only has an ambition of around 5% of the country to be rewilded. So, so this is a relatively small percentage, the vast majority of which will be on marginally productive land anyway. So I do not accept that rewilding need have a significant impact on food production if we tackle the, the food waste issue. Now, let's move into policy, and we've got all the right signals from the 25-year plan. Even, I've noticed recently in the headline, this reference to reintroducing species that we've lost from our countryside. That's a headline in the 25-year plan and Nature Recovery Network ambitions. But we've got 500,000 hectares of additional habitat to find. It is not going to be possible to do that in a traditional nature reserve management way. So I, I reiterate, rewilding is the option that gives us the opportunity to do this at scale without it being a massive financial burden. And if we come to ELM itself, I just want to focus particularly on tier two and tier three. I see rewilding really sitting in tier three, but tier two has a very significant role because if we focus on connectivity there, high quality corridors between core rewilding areas and and large protected areas, and we focus on complementarity, in other words, creating buffer zones to support larger, wilder areas in tier three, uh, then the two can work very well together. And indeed, landowners, as they start to cluster up, could migrate from one tier to another. In tier three, the reasons for having rewilding in there, rather than just these independent individual uh, interventions are that you get great, much greater efficiencies of scale of carrying out multiple interventions in the same place. You've got the same people, same skills, machinery, permissions, consents, communications, etc. Uh, you're going to get a much greater extent of the delivery of public goods. You're not just going to be targeting carbon or just water quality or flood risk management. You'll be able to deliver across all of those and health and well-being, etc. And it's likely to be much more affordable over the long term and generate greater local economic benefits, nature-based tourism, etc. If you're doing all of these things in the same place, it, 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 you just get more bang for your buck, basically. So that is where we would like to see rewilding sit as an option uh, amongst many other options. And, and of course, uh, incentivizing it in this way will inspire others. You know, we have this great this great example um, from, from NEP. Uh, we need, you know, we need a NEP in every county. And, and if we had that, we, we would multiply up the inspiration and action across the land. And here is a, a, a crude schematic of where, where, how it might all fit together. You have rewilding core areas sitting within buffered areas. The rewilding areas would, would be scheme three. The buffered areas would be scheme two. You'd have them connected to each other. You'd have them connected to urban areas so that people can access truly wild countryside. They could include triple SIs within them. I'm already in discussion with Natural England colleagues at a senior level about more flexibility for protected areas in terms of rewilding. And, and so this is uh, generally how it might sit. And by the way, I just want to emphasize that uh, it, it does and would apply, rewilding would apply in the sea uh, around the coastline as well. 
I just want to quickly run you through a, a, a lowland animation example, courtesy of Charlie Burrell and Nepp, um, which I've just received recently, which, which shows you how it might work in a lowland situation. Uh, in an upland situation, we're just developing a schematic for that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, publicize that soon. But just a quick run through and you'll see how developing connectivity and core, core sites within this landscape uh, can develop a much wilder feel to it. And uh, it's important to realize that, you know, this, this landscape still includes food production, as you can see, as things change. But what's really important is connectivity and then the development of key areas, key wetland areas within the landscape. And, and this is probably still what I call tier, it's sort of borderline tier two, tier three, but it is then possible once you have enough landowners signed up to the same ambition that one could move into a tier three situation. So I, I'm gonna finish there. Um, I just want to uh, uh, quote this uh, very important statement from Tony Juniper, um, which he said at a meeting with myself and various other organizations last year. Rewilding will be a massively important part of the Nature Recovery Network, but it's absolutely essential that we are brave about it and bold about it. We embrace the term, we embrace the principles, and we embed it in future land management policy. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. And uh, thanks everybody for bearing with us while we had a few challenges with sound and slides. Um, we'll have a chat with the panellists afterwards and see if at least we were able to share perhaps some of uh, Alistair's slides for those of you because they weren't quite always in sync, which is, uh, which is our issue, so apologies. Um, okay, so we're going to jump into some questions, but before I do, um, if people's tummies might be rumbling a little early and they might jump off the webinar just at the end of the questions, I just wanted to mention um, briefly that if you've enjoyed what you've heard today and you've enjoyed being part of the webinar then we would be massively grateful for your support. SIOM are a charity like many others and um, have been fairly significantly impacted as you can imagine by COVID-19. So if you want to we'd be very very grateful. Head to siom.org forward slash donate and if you're able to then that would be wonderful. Okay so Chris, Alistair, thank you. Uh, I'm going to use chairs prerogative and jump in with the first question if that's okay. So Alistair, you've talked about rewilding being a means of delivering multiple, perhaps more extensive public goods than singularly focused specific activities like tree planting. And Chris, the NCC report warned that if we're too focused, for want of a better word, with our approach to tackling decarbonisation through nature-based interventions, then there are risks of trade-offs and a failure to deliver that wider benefit. So with that in mind, chaps, where's the balance between as rapid as progress as possible on decarbonisation and ensuring the kind of optimum multifunctionality in terms of ecosystem services provided. Maybe I head to Chris first, if that's okay. Chris, you're muted. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult challenge that to know exactly how you implement things. And I guess I'd go back to the point in my slide where we really aren't up to speed with our modeling capability at the moment in terms of natural capital in a particular catchment as Alistair promoted, or you know, uh, even at a larger scale, or even down to the farm scale. So if we can get that modeling right, then we can start to develop the plan and you can then maybe bring in the economics to see how going through a rapid carbon scenario would compare with a, more, a broader scenario that emphasizes all the ecosystem services you want to deliver. So I think, that's where I'd like to see the emphasis at the moment. It's about understanding, and I guess that, you know, it pans out to greater. We don't really know what a fully functional landscape in every part of the country looks like. And it, it's that, that sort of design. Alistair. Yeah. Um, well, my, my plea is that we don't get too picky about this to start with. You know, we, we, there's so much we need to crack on with. We, you know, we have a, uh, a biodiversity crisis we have a climate emergency let's get on and do those things which we know are going to make a difference and i for example i'm working with an estate in yorkshire where we are uh, we've joined up with the environment agency for a natural flood management program of work um, to reduce flood risk downstream now we can crack on and deliver those natural flood management interventions as part of a bigger rewilding project and in so doing we will be delivering for multiple other benefits uh, even though the focus is flood risk management. 
Um, uh, and, and it really is a no brainer to get on and do it in that particular type of landscape. And, you know, I can point you to thousands of places across the country where there are plenty of things we know we need to do to, to tackle more than one of these ecosystem services whilst delivering biodiversity. But in the meantime, yes, we need more and better evidence and baselining and science. I totally agree with Chris. We need that. We need to get better at that. But that, let's not let that hold us back. Let's crack on. Yeah, I wouldn't say we wait while we get the models yeah. correct. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with Alistair. You know, simple things that we know work, like natural flood management, these being tried and tested in various catchments. Yeah, let's get on with that first. Yeah, absolutely. Is it perfection is the enemy of progress? I'm kind of with you on that one, chaps. Uh, great, no, thank you. Um, so, one final one, I'm going to hand over to Alistair and he's going to pull together some of the themes that have come through on the Q&A. So, uh, Chris, the NCC report noted that nature-based solutions are generally cheaper than more heavily engineered ones. Um, Alistair, you've said rewilding gives you more bang for your buck, so how much cash do uh, ELMs need to achieve net zero and nature recovery? And is it possible on similar sums to those currently paid out, which is around three billion a year, or do we need more? Could we spend less? What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, well, uh, I've done some, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Chris, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, it's okay, uh, it gives me time to think, Alice. So okay. okay. I've, done, I've done some sums on this, and um, my view is that three billion is not enough. Um, uh, just very crudely, I did some calculations on approximate, you know, amounts of money that landowners, farmers should be paid per hectare, I think, for this kind of work. If you assume that might be £300 a hectare, this is crude averaging, by the way. Uh, we, we at Rewilding Britain and indeed other organisations have an ambition for 30% nature recovery, approximately, across the country. Uh, doing the sums, that boils down to uh, something like four billion pounds worth required. Um, now, if we had three billion, and there's no guarantee, of course, we will have three billion for the likes of Elms, but it'd be fantastic if we did. But you still need another billion for somewhere. And my view is that should come from private sources. That is where your carbon taxation should kick in. That is where water company contributions should kick in to top that up to that kind of figure. And I think if, we, if we're at that level, we're about right, certainly, to hit the ground running. Yeah. I guess I'd support what Alistair says. Um, and it would be great if the three billion could stay within the communities it currently supports, but obviously spread across environmental um, schemes because those people need supporting. Uh, we don't want to just drop them with, with no support. Uh, and I guess the other thing I would add is coming back to my own area of soil management, we know that the sort of wider environmental costs of poor soil management uh, is 1.4 billion per year. So we get soil management right through ELMS, we can then go back to government and say, look, we're protecting uh, uh, other uh, areas in the environment. So it's a good investment and it goes back to sort of the, uh, the, the graphic I put up earlier from the Climate Change Committee. And one of the key costs is actually from, from soil erosion uh, and the sort of on costs that that creates at the downstream water treatment works. I would, could I just flag that one current uh, anomaly, which, which is a good example of how far we need to move on this. Currently, the proportion of the Environment Agency budget spent on flood risk management that is spent on natural flood management solutions is less than 1% of the capital program, less than 1%. It needs to be 10 to 20%, I would argue, to be, for it to be proportional and, and for it to deliver all these multiple benefits. And, and that comes back to funding rules, and et cetera. I understand that it's complicated, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, problem that we need to solve quickly in parallel with developing this ELM scheme. Thanks, chaps. That's really helpful. Um, I've also been corrected. It's don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, not progress. Yes, yeah. things, I'm really sorry, everybody. Uh, so, Alistair, um, can I hand over to you for some of the kind of key themes for our final Q and A? If that's okay. Sure. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, really, a question um, for Chris initially, and it's not explicitly Elms um, related, but uh, there were a number of questions came up in this context. Um, and that really relates to the balance between um, moving from biodiversity net gain to environmental net gain. Um, and there was some concern that this 
um, could kind of let developers off the hook a little bit uh, because I think biodiversity net gain is, is considered to be potentially the hardest component of environmental net gain to deliver um, and the sort of the, the sacrosanct foundation of environmental net gain. How, do, how can we deliver environmental net gain effectively but whilst ensuring that nature recovery is, is a part of that? I think I was coming at it from a, a different angle. I hope I haven't been misunderstood. So what I was saying, if we totally focus on biodiversity net gain, we can miss the wider environmental net gain. And the example I gave was sort of small air, green areas in urban environments. So I think our worry on the committee is that in planning, developers will pay for small amounts of biodiversity net gain off site potentially, uh, and that will only affect a very small amount uh, of the environment if they just sort of, I, I'm trying to think of a good example, but just a, a small pond for uh, crested newts, whereas actually we've lost a whole green field which could access for a hundred of people locally, all the wellbeing benefits of that, and obviously there's some biodiversity within that green space that may not be sort of a, a protected species, for example. So I think it, it, that's the balance I think we're concerned about will get lost if we only focus on biodiversity in that game. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And um, kind of a, a, in a way a related issue um, about trying to make the, the best of, of smaller areas. Um, Alistair, really, in terms of rewilding, I think you touched on this a little bit, but um, how much potential is there to build up a network of small sites that will work effectively as a, as a rewilding instrument rather than um, focusing on, on the larger sites, which uh, are really you know, a bit of a focus at the moment, um, particularly in areas like Cornwall where um, those larger sites may be a little bit difficult to, to um, obtain. Is that yeah. a realistic way forward? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, this is a very important aspect. We, we, we should not exclude anyone from uh, being on this rewilding spectrum and able to move up it. In fact, we're setting up a rewilding network, which we're launching later this year, which will um, provide advice and guidance for all scales of rewilding. And we are doing our best to try and connect people up. But I think that's, that, you know, that, that starts really, if we look at Elm particularly, that, that starts with elements of tier one, where good things are happening at a very small scale uh, in, in a given catchment area. But, but really it's tier two where you start to get people operating at a, a bigger and bigger scale and, and being more ambitious. And uh, you can do a certain amount of rewilding at small scale, but you are very limited in, in terms of being able to apply all the principles of hands-off management over, or reduced management over time if you are operating at small scale. You know, I have people say, oh, I want to rewild my local highway verges or my roundabouts. Well, probably if you just stop doing things there, you'll just end up with brambles and nettles for a very, very long time. And so it, it, is, it is important that you try and operate at a bigger scale where you can have animals that are creating this heterogeneity of habitat. Great, thank you. Um, there's, there's all kinds of different questions here, so I'm gonna hop about a little bit. Um, Chris, there was some, some questioning around peat um, and particularly how uh, we improve soil carbon levels um, and, and basically around peat, if, if they should only um, have low impact agriculture on them, um, what do we do in areas like the fens where you've got grade one and two uh, agricultural land which, which is really intensively um, farmed? Uh, how do we manage peat in those those kind of areas? My, my personal view, and I stress this is a personal view, I think we have to stop a lot of the agriculture in the lowland fence. It's uh, degrading those peats at a rate that is completely unsustainable and the carbon sequestration and other benefits of that peat outweighs their value for agriculture in my opinion. Um, I can't remember the exact figures in the Committee on Climate Change report but they put forward some quite uh, persuasive arguments about small changes uh, in lowland peats uh, and by, while, while still maintaining the agricultural production. So there's things like flooding during the winter in order to maintain uh, the peat and stop the degradation, for example. But as I say, my personal view is I don't think agriculture is appropriate in those areas. 
And I am aware that that creates spin-off arguments of where we get our salad pods from. Great, thank you. Nikki, have we got time for one more? Yeah, we have. I think we've got one more quick. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, one other thing that caught people's imagination was the, the census that you talked about of, of environmental assets. Um, and really people wondering whether the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment and the uh, Natural Capital Atlases, um, both the one for England and, and the uh, local ones that are forthcoming, will those effectively inform and, and constitute that census or, or is there something more specific that, that I mean the, the yeah. census is mainly Kathy Willis's vision on the committee she's the one who sort of uh, pushed forward with it but I think we very much see it would be impossible to do this uh, as a um, as one organization uh, we see this as multiple organizations and there's lots of uh, potential for citizen science type engagement in putting all those different components they measure like you know we have fantastic records, for example, on butterfly numbers, and that's all amateurs who create that. So it's about pulling all that data to develop, together to develop the census. So we have things like the countryside survey that uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology have done for years. So it's pulling it all together to develop the census. It's, it's not a, you know, death for us suddenly deciding we're gonna do a census and we're gonna employ the people to do it. We see it as collating lots of different organisations. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I think probably I'll, we'll draw it to a close there, if that's okay. Um, I wanted to thank both Chris and Alistair, but also our speakers, James and Mari, earlier on um, for your brilliant contributions. It's been a really, really genuinely fascinating couple of hours. Um, and I really hope the audience uh, have felt a little more informed that we've done our best to try and reflect some of your questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. It was wonderful to have so much engagement. Um, for the next webinar that we're going to do, we're going to work out if we can try and make questions visible to everybody as well and a bit more interactive because I'm conscious that it's sometimes helpful to know what other people are thinking, isn't it? Um, if you haven't already, then I'd encourage you to head to slido.com G906 and uh, you can submit some of your feedback into DEFRA as well as letting us know if you're a site member, it's useful for us to know. Um, so ELMS and the concept of public money for public goods feels particularly of our time. So let's hope it serves to be the foundation for a zero carbon Britain that is teeming with wildlife a couple of decades down the line. Um, so just my final request, if, if you have enjoyed this morning, um, and we hope you have, uh, then we hope you like the fact that it was free. And as an organisation, we really want to bring this kind of event to as wide an audience as possible. I think we had five, 600 people online uh, um, during the session, which is wonderful particularly important to building a green recovery from present circumstances. So if you can help us to consider to do these things in the future, then just head to sirem.org forward slash donate and even an extremely small donation all makes a huge difference. And this is just the beginning of our little webinar series. We'd really like to see you back for week two. So same time uh, next Wednesday morning and we'll be hearing about how Elms can deliver natural flood management effectively and extensively and I'm sure it's going to be really fascinating. Enjoy the rest of your day, I hope it's sunny where you are and I'll see you next week. Bye bye now.